Good morning, everyone, and welcome to a special edition of the EMA's Knowledge Series 2020. Today's topic is Understanding the National Wildlife Survey. The National Restoration Carbon Sequestration Wildlife and Livelihoods Project, launched in March 2010, was an initiative of the Environmental Management Authority and was financed by the Green Fund of Trinidad and Tobago. The project focused on the reforestation of the degraded lands of the Nariva Swamp, an environmentally sensitive area. 236 hectares have been reforested to date, contributing to a reduction in carbon footprint in Trinidad and Tobago. The National Wildlife Survey 2014 to 2018 formed part of the project and was the first national study designed to obtain baseline data on five game species. The agouti, armadillo, dare, lap, and quank, also known as wild hog. It also successfully engaged hunting groups, key stakeholders in the execution of the survey. Before introducing the presenters, I will quickly share some housekeeping with respect to this virtual session. There will be a simultaneous broadcast on the EMA's Facebook page and viewers on Facebook will be able to pose questions on the topic in the comments thread. If you're participating via Zoom, please use the chat box for questions. We will not be using the Q&A function or the raised hand icon. However, feel free to use both the thumbs up and clap icons. We will try to entertain all questions, but those that cannot be answered because of time constraints or because they need detailed responses, we ask that you send them to emawebinars at ema.co.tt. EMA webinars, one word, webinars, plural, with an S at ema.co.tt. A short poll of four questions will be launched approximately 10 minutes before the session ends. These questions will be up for three to four minutes, after which the poll will close. I will alert you just before the poll is launched, which will be during the question and answer segment. This webinar is being recorded and, we, and will be uploaded by tomorrow afternoon to the EMA's website, www.eme.co.tt, with a link to the EMA's YouTube page. I will now introduce our presenters. First, we have Professor John Agard, who is a professor of tropical island ecology and the director of the Center of Innovation and Entrepreneurship at the University of the West Indies, St. Augustine campus. He was the former head of the Department of Life Sciences, Faculty of Science and Technology. His research interest is in the field of sustainable science, especially as it relates to mainstreaming environmental considerations, such as blue and circular economy development, biodiversity and ecosystem services conservation, along with climate change mitigation and adaptation into the core of policy and decision-making. Professor Agard was appointed by the United Nations Secretary General to co-chair the 2030 Global Sustainable Development Report team. He's also a member of the first National Council for Sustainable Development in Trinidad and Tobago. Dr. Luke Roster is a wildlife biologist in the Department of Life Sciences, Faculty of Science and Technology at the University of the West Indies, St. Augustine campus. He is the program coordinator for the Diploma and MSc in Biodiversity Conservation and Sustainable Development in the Caribbean. Dr. Rostan holds a BSc in Biology and Zoology and an MPhil in Zoology from the University of the West Indies. He pursued his PhD in Interdisciplinary Ecology at the University of Florida, Gainesville. His research interests focus on biodiversity monitoring especially with respect to mammals. I will now like to introduce Professor John Agard to give a background on this survey, and he will be followed by Dr. Luke Roster, who will present the findings of the survey. Professor Agard. Good, good morning, all of the participants in this important uh, webinar. I'm just going to introduce Dr. Roster, who will make a presentation. So I will start off by giving you a little bit of a story 
um, that it's all about sustainability. Um, in the, the book on the history of Tobago, which was produced in the early, early 1800s, it mentions that there were dare and peccary in Tobago. I should add that now there are none. So that we're in a situation where management of wildlife resources is quite critical and important in order to ensure sustainability. So in the existing Trinidad and Tobago um, system, there's a hunting season, which requires that you get a hunting license from the forestry division. And, and it has on it a limit of how many game you can kill. You're also required to fill in a form reporting on the number of game killed. The feedback is that some of that data is unreliable as persons may make up data and write it on the form, which they resubmit. So collecting field data on wildlife began in 2014 during a hunting ban, and this was about three governments ago. The opportunity during this period was to determine from objective data whether hunting actually had any measurable effects on the numbers of wildlife, and if so, could this information be used to introduce management measures to ensure the sustainability of wildlife? So let me just mention something about management measures. Management measures could be, for example, to ban or to decrease the number of hunting permits for certain species in selected places during the hunting season, based on the, the, the numbers. The, to collect objective data, the UE team recommended using camera traps, which take pictures of every animal that passes in front of them, day and night, based on an infrared detector. At the time, those who were making the, the final decision, those who were in authority, decided that during the hunting ban, they wished to, to hire people in communities to collect the data so they could have a source of income. As a result, the UE team traveled to various communities to train people in the standardized methods of doing wildlife, what is called line transects, um, line transect surveys, requiring walking one kilometer using a global positioning system, GPS, in forested areas and determining the distance using a range finder and uh, measuring the angle of animals sighted. And Dr. Rasta will talk more about that. The issue with line transects, of course, is, is related to the low detection of nocturnal animals because you're only walking during the day. So later on, in around 2015, camera trap surveys were also introduced and Dr. Rasta will go into some detail about the methodology details of determining relative numbers and activity patterns. So we can see what animals are active during the night and what during the day and so forth, or, or what animals are active during both day and night. So the point Trinidad Tobago is at now is to continue doing wildlife surveys day and night using camera traps and use the objective data as a basis for introducing wildlife management measures. Um, you know, to assure, let me emphasize again, to assure sustainability. So let me hand over now to Dr. Rasta, who will go into some of the details of how this is done. Thank you very much. Okay, good morning, everybody. Thank you very much for that uh, introduction and for the opportunity to present on uh, what myself and my colleagues believe to be a very um, noble and, and a very uh, important project. Um, and we're hoping that these are but some of the initial results that we can present to the people of Trinidad and Tobago and beyond. So today I'm going to really be focusing on the third point there, which is the results and the discussion. Um, but I will go into a bit more detail on the objectives of our study, the methods, um, the conclusion, of course, to the study, as well as our recommendations based on the study. Now, as, as was said before, the main objective of this study uh, was to conduct countrywide survey and census of the five main species of game in Trinidad and Tobago. And these are the deer, quenk, or peccary, agouti, lap, and tatu. It's important, however, to recognize that while this was the main objective, uh, the methodology that was employed would have picked up other species uh, not including game species. And, and of course, 
recordings on all of these species would have been made. So we do have, you know, a, a substantial amount of data on other species, which we will present. Um, but I want people to recognize that, you know, while it was focused uh, on these surveys to focus on these five game species, other species were also um, identified and surveyed as well. The, this main objective can be broken down into several sub objectives. I don't want to go into details on this because these will be highlighted uh, within the results. So I really want to get into a lot of the results. But some of the sub objectives involved were to establish density estimates of these main game species, to map out where these game species were, to look at what we call occupancy uh, by these different game species. And of course, at the end, we will make recommendations based on what we have found. So mammal monitoring is, as you might imagine, something that is, is um, quite complicated. It involves uh, several different methods. But the methods that were chosen were those that could be easily replicable for future surveys. Because the idea is hopefully not to only do this for a period of, of a few years, but hopefully to extend this well beyond. And then we can compare and contrast what was found in what we could consider to be a baseline survey to how the populations of these species are doing in the future. So the two methods that were employed were the transect survey or using distant sampling methods and camera trapping. Now with respect to the line transects, as was mentioned before, the line transects were, were set at one kilometer in terms of length and we had groups of about four individuals with different jobs uh, that walked these line transects as straight as they could and as quietly as possible so as to not disturb the wildlife that they were encountering. So you walk along the transect and if you spotted an animal, you would measure the distance to the animal using a range finder. You would also use a, an angle board to measure the angle off of your transect line to the animal. You would take a GPS point, which would of course allow us to map out where the species are located. And based on the sighting distance, as well as your sighting angle, we can measure the perpendicular distance. And those perpendicular distances can in turn be used to calculate what we call absolute abundance. In other words, in this case, we're seeing an agouti. How many agouti do we have per square kilometer in this particular area? And I'll talk a little bit about absolute abundance, but I'll also be mentioning something called relative abundance later on when we get to the results of the camera trap survey. Now for the camera trap survey, the camera traps were set at about, um, you know, 30 to 50 centimeters at the base of a tree. Uh, they were put within uh, a metal box to secure them. A cable was put through the cameras to try to secure it as best as possible to the tree. And if, as, the, as is seen in the case of this particular camera, if the, the camera happened to be on a hill, it might be angled downwards so that we could ensure that the animals that might be captured would be contained within the field of view, okay? With respect to the cameras within these different uh, areas, and I'll get into the maps of, of all of the sites that were sampled in a second, a random point was chosen and then a grid was put over the entire area and we did a systematic uh, locating of cameras within the grid okay and the cameras were separated at about two square kilometers apart okay the cameras were set in these areas for one month and the cameras were set and removed in the same order so the camera that i would have installed on day one would be removed on day 30. The camera that was installed on day five might be removed on day 35. The idea is to get at least 30 days of data from a camera at a given site. And that's what was intended uh, following uh, what, was, what was done in other neotropical and tropical sites throughout the world using what is termed the Tropical Ecosystem Assessment and Monitoring Network Protocol. So we started in 2014, and these are all of the different transects that were walked back in 2014. So you see, we had transects that were set in, in the Blanchichers area, in the Matura area, Central Range, Central Wildlife 
Sanctuary, Nariva, Trinity Hills, and Southern Watershed. So this was in, 20, in the wet season of 2014. In 2015, we see we added Chagaramas to the list of locations where transect surveys were conducted. Now, Professor Agard mentioned the fact that transects were only conducted during the daytime. And after the dry season of 2015, after we had collected a year of data from the Blanche Shares and Matura areas, what was recognized is that in areas of, of very rugged terrain, these transect surveys were not being very successful. And we believe that they were uh, underestimating the, the game species that might be there. The reason for this, of course, is if you're in rugged terrain and you're you know, a party of four walking along a transect line, not only is it very difficult to do, but you're also likely to be making quite a bit of noise and maybe scaring off a lot of um, animals that you might encounter. So in the wet season of 2016, we stopped doing the transect surveys in the, in the Black Sheds and the Matura area. We did one more season of transect surveys in the Chagramas area just to be able to get one year's worth. Uh, but we continued with the transect surveys in the Central Range, the river, um, Victoria Miara Forest Reserve in Trinity Hills area and the Southern Watershed. So this is what you see in the dry season of 2016. And then finally, we were able to get um, enough cameras to conduct our first camera trapping survey in, um, the, in the wet season of 2016, starting in Chagarama. Okay. So each of these points that you see in this map, they are camera trap locations spaced at about two square kilometers each, All right? In the dry season of 2017, this is when we were able to really get our most comprehensive camera trap survey done. So you see camera trap surveys taking place in Chagaramas, in the Matura area, in Central Range, in the Riva. And in order to see and compare the data from transect surveys as well as camera trap surveys, we undertook transect surveys as well in the, in the Nariva area. Um, the Trinity Hills, Victoria Miara Forest Reserve uh, also had camera trapping that year in dry season of 2017. Finally, in Tobago, we were able to get transect surveys done both in the dry and the wet season um, in the main ridge forest reserve in Tobago. And then in 2018, we continued with a subset of what had been done before, um, given funding, which funding limitations and so on. So we were able to do um, camera trapping in Chagaramas, in the Matura area, and in the Nariva area. And in this particular survey, we did two things. We did the normal camera trap surveys, which is a, a single camera deployment, but we also, at the sites that you see in yellow, in both the Matura area as well as the New River area. We also did dual camera trap setups. And the idea there was to test whether or not we could get density estimates for one of the environmentally sensitive species in Trinidad, uh, the ocelot, okay? Um, the ocelot lends itself to that sort of sampling because it, they have unique coats and you can identify individuals and you can use mock recapture methods in order to get estimates of density. Uh, in this case, we were able to get estimates of density in the Nariva area. Um, and hopefully we can continue uh, and get enough data from Matura and other sites to get ocelot density estimates um, for several different parts of Trinidad. So that's basically what was done between 2014 to 2018 with respect to, to the wildlife survey. And now I wanna get into a lot of what we found with respect to the results. Now remember, for the transect surveys, you're going to see absolute density estimates. In other words, these are numbers of individuals of a particular species per square kilometer. With the camera trap surveys, however, these are going to be relative abundance estimates. And the way that we calculate these relative abundance estimates is we give you an idea of how many captures using these cameras there are of a particular species per 100 trap nights. In other words, if I left this camera out or these cameras out for 100 nights, how many captures of a particular species might I expect to find in a given area? 
Okay, so that's a relative abundance value. Okay, with respect to the transect surveys, as this slide illustrates, we had over 1,300 kilometers surveyed, so a very uh, substantial distance walk um, from 2014 to 2017. We had um, almost, you know, uh, over 4,600 animals seen, and a, a substantial proportion of those animals were of these five game species. So almost 1,700 animals that were actually seen were of these five game species. Uh, and it's important to recognize also, these are species that are actually seen and identified by these uh, hunting groups and community groups and so on. So it's not, it's not whether or not there are signs of an animal, it's whether or not they actually see the animal. Um, signs can be used, and I'll get into a bit more on that later on in the presentation. So again, quite a substantial proportion. Um, over a third of the sample, almost 40% as a matter of fact, uh, of our five game species. With respect to the results, um, what you will see on the top line, and I apologize if it's a little small, what you will see on the top line here, these are the density estimates and the confidence interval, 95% confidence interval for these estimates you'll see below in brackets, okay? So we have these estimates for Nariva, the Southern Watershed, Central Range, Matura, which was, again, not reliable, uh, Victoria Miaro and Trinity Hills, and Chagramas, and then we average these values or do another calculation for all of Trinidad, okay? So I'll focus on, on the Trinidadian average, but it's important to recognize that we do have these estimates for these different areas, okay? And, and that's a, a really important base. Now, what you'll notice from this is that with respect to Guti, the values go from anywhere between 23 Aguti per square kilometer to about 32 Aguti per square kilometer. There, we actually saw an, an increase in the uh, number of there over time uh, from one to about eight per square kilometer. And with respect to lap and tattoo, these estimates are of course not reliable. So, you know, you're seeing less than one, less than one here, but because it was diurnal surveys or surveys we were conducting during the day, these are not reliable whatsoever. With respect to peccary, however, as the camera trap data revealed, these are diurnal. These are active during the day. And these values here are probably a reflection of, of the um, estimates that are actually out there with respect to wild hog. And it may be something that we want to pay attention to. If we were to compare our densities to the, the last time a survey was conducted of this type, to, uh, the values in central range, Central range had quite low estimates before at about eight Aguti per square kilometer, right? Again, we had between 23 to 32. Uh, Robinson and Redford have, have calculated estimates for all of these different species. Uh, and when we compare to their value of 56, where, you know, we're about just above halfway uh, of, you know, of what they estimated, maybe, maybe to about a third of the way, um, this species, of course, the values vary quite a bit across its range, but the values that we are seeing with regards to Aguti are, in fact, values that you might expect, given the fact that it is a species that is hunted. It also has a high reproductive rate, so that if given the chance, this, this species is likely to reproduce quite quickly and recover from a given hunting season. Red rocket there, we were quite heartened to see. Uh, these values actually increased over time, and they are comparable to what we find in other parts of the neotropics, okay? If not, maybe just a little bit below, again, what you might expect to find from a species that is hunted, okay? Lap and tattoo, if we compare, you know, if we try to compare these to Robertson and Redford estimates or other estimates, it really doesn't make sense because these were, again, daytime surveys and what we have um, what we have to do is, is use camera trapping or some other estimation techniques for these species and other nocturnal species. Wild hog, um, on the other hand, these estimates were quite low. And as I've said before, uh, this species is a, di a diurnal species. It comes out in the day as the peak of activity showed when we looked at the camera trap data. 
So if there were any species that I might be concerned about looking at the transect data, it would be the wild hog, okay, the pecker. So if we look at the overall results with respect to camera trap surveys, the data uh, that we got from these cameras, we were actually able to get data from about 292 of 310 cameras that were deployed. Not every camera, of course, is going to work. Uh, sometimes they, they, you know, they, they go a little crazy and they take thousands of pictures for one or two days and then they shut down. Sometimes um, vegetation might grow up in front of them and it, it doesn't allow us uh, to actually see anything that might be captured. But getting 292 uh, camera sites, data from 292 camera sites is, is quite, quite a good result. Okay. If you look at the amount of camera trap days, it's, it's almost 15,000 camera trap days, uh, which is very substantial for the island of Trinidad as well as Tobago. And then when you look at the amount of pictures, um, over 84,000 pictures were processed. Um, most of these pictures would be of animals. I'm not going to say all of them were of animals, but most of them would have been of animals, inclusive of the five game species. Okay. And then we would use these pictures to calculate the relative abundance in captures per 100 trap days to each of the terrestrial mammals. And I'll present these results just now. But before I present them, I want to also highlight the fact that when we are calculating these relative abundance values, we set the time frame for which a capture might be considered a single capture at one hour. So in other words, if I have an agouti that might be going back and forth in front of the camera, I'm not going to consider each and every time the, the agouti goes in front of the camera to be a separate capture. It is going to be considered one capture for the entire hour or any hour that might overlap afterwards. And that is done throughout the world and it is done so that um, we can compare our estimates, but also we are not going to overestimate um, the relative abundance value uh, for these different species. So I'll go through some of the nice pictures that we found um, during the course of the surveys, because I think, you know, one of the nice things about camera trap surveys is you, you do get to see uh, some really beautiful animals. And I, I'd be remiss if I didn't share some of these pictures with you. So here we have a red rocket there. Here we have peccary. Um, and there are actually individuals huddled below the tree down there. A well camouflaged ocelot. Here's a Terra. Here we have a crab eating raccoon, Tatu, Maniku, Tamandua. We very seldomly get monkeys, but in this case, we got one on the ground. This is a red howler monkey. Here we have a, a white fronted capuchin. We have uh, uh, a species that is perhaps invasive at the moment down in Chagramas. This is the tufted capuchin. We have lots of pictures of these guys playing on the grounds in, in Chagramas. Um, here we have a paca. Our most abundant uh, capture was, was the agouti. Here we have a squirrel. And every now and then the cameras would pick up something really special. Here we have a tamandua with, with young on its back. And here we have, for Matura, we have a Powie, but the Powie actually has a chick falling close behind, confirming um, some of its reproductive behavior. Okay. Um, I also should have noted that in the top left-hand corner, you see the, the date that the picture was taken as well as the time. So we can get from this metadata, the, the data associated with the picture in terms of the time and the date, we can get peaks of activity within a year. Perhaps if we were done over the course of an entire year, we could get peaks in activity over the year. So I've highlighted the highest values for the different um, NAMI game species within this uh, table here. The relative abundance values are what you want to focus on. These are in brackets next to the 
number of independent captures that you see beside it. So uh, the red bracket there was most abundant in terms of relative abundance in the Chagramas area in 2017. Okay. The peccary, this was most abundant in Matura. This was in 2017 again. Here we have um, the nine banded armadillo in Tobago, a relative abundance of 11 point, let's say about 11 uh, captured per 100 trap nights. We have lap at about 11 per 100 trap nights. This was in the river. Uh, and Aguti again, um, also quite high, as you can see here, at about 44 per 100 trap nights, also in, in the Nariba area. Okay, so I've highlighted others as well um, within this table. So these are all relative abundance values. And here, in terms of habit, you can see which, are, which of these are terrestrial and which of these would therefore produce the most reliable results versus those that are more arboreal. Uh, which again would not be as reliable because these cameras are located on the ground. Okay, but these are these are relative abundance values. In 2018, uh, we only did Chagramas, Matura, and Nariva, but again, uh, Chagramas had the highest values for there. Uh, Matura had the highest values for Peccary, but again, these relative abundance values are, are quite low for, for Peccary. Um, Nine Mountain, Armadillo, Matura, Paca, Matura again uh, in, this, in this year, and um, Red Rump Taguti at about 28 per 100 trap days. As I was saying before, the, the cameras also allow us to identify the habits of these animals, and we can categorize whether or not they are diurnal, nocturnal, um, or cathemeral. Cathemeral means that they can come out any time of the day. Uh, there doesn't appear to be uh, any rhyme or reason as to why they are coming out at a given time. So red rum taguti, mostly diurnal. Uh, and this, of course, these, le these next two would lend credence to why it is the line transect surveys were not, not successful for these two game species, um, the lap and the armadillo. So we see that they are both nocturnal, classified as nocturnal. Um, Red brocket there, cathemeral, uh, ocelot also cathemeral, uh, or possums, nocturnal, colored peccary, mostly diurnal, uh, southern tamandua, mostly nocturnal, and tufted kabutin. I just put that in there, that's also there. So we can, of course, plot these out. Aguti tend to have these peaks in activity, okay, early morning and in the uh, afternoon period, okay, late afternoon period. Armadillo, you can see uh, very nocturnal in terms of their habit. Um, these are the daytime hours from, from about, let's say, maybe 6 a.m. till about 6 p.m. there. And there's, there's very little activity taking place. Lap Paca, very nocturnal in terms of their habit. Red Brocket there, this is why it's classified as, as cathemeral, even though there was a peak of activity around 7 p.m. Um, you see that there's kind of peaks uh, all over the place with this with this particular species. Followed peccary, peak of activity somewhere around two in the afternoon, between um, maybe 11 to two in the afternoon. So this this species is classified as mostly dying. Ocelot, cathemeral, you see that the, there are these peaks all over the place um, for ocelot. And this was data that was combined for all of Trinidad. <clears throat> Now, one of the objectives is also to look at something called occupancy. And what we have here is just naive occupancy. So I'm not going to present too long on this, but what you'll consistently see in these different areas is that the agouti is highest. Okay, so here, it's the number of sites that, are, that, are, that an agouti was found at with respect to the cameras. Um, so at about 82% about of, the, of the cameras picked up agouti in, in Matura versus 90% of the sites in Nariva, for example, okay? Uh, what's also important to recognize is that the occupancy is quite high with regards to Paca, Red Rocket there, Nine Banded Armadillo, okay? Um, for Peccary, it's a little bit lower, it's at about 26%. For 
for the mature area, in other words, it was found on, on about 26% of the cameras. Um, but peccary was not found in the river, um, and we did not, of course, find that species in Tobago either. Red rum taguti, again, um, not as high as we find in Trinidad. In Trinidad, it's found between typically about 80 to 90% of the, of the cameras. Here, we're finding it between you know, 40 and 50%. Another objective, of course, would be to map out all of these different game species. And we, of course, took GPS points for any time a, a species was seen on the transit line. And we, of course, have GPS point locations for where all of the camera traps were set. We can, we can then map everything out. Um, we can then, in future, uh, do something called species distribution modeling and figure out which sites are most favorable for different species? What kinds of habitats do these different species prefer? And all of this, of course, can go into how you manage these different species. Okay. So this is this is for red rocket there. This is in the central range. Here we have uh, red howler monkeys. Um, I put this in here because I wanted everyone to recognize. You know, we we weren't only focusing on game species. So you see red howler monkeys in the southern watershed. Um, you can also do nice relative abundance maps for different species. So here's uh, the distribution in 2017 uh, for the camera trapping for a booty. Here we have red rocket there, um, nine banded armadillo. Um, anywhere that you're seeing a green dot, um, basically we, we found the species at that camera. Uh, anywhere you're seeing a yellow dot means that it was not seen at that site by that camera. So here is Paca relative abundance, none in, none in Chagaramas, but um, in all of the other sites that were surveyed in 2017. Followed Peccary, uh, found in Matura and the Trinity Hills. Um, Tobago, we see that, for whatever reason, we see quite a few nine-banded armadillo um, towards the western part of the uh, wildlife, of the um, uh, central, uh, of the main ridge for main ridge uh, forest reserve there, okay? We have not picked up, as uh, Professor Agard was mentioning, we haven't picked up any, any deer that was introduced into Tobago for hunting. Um, uh, we haven't picked up any as yet in terms of the, the camera trapping surveys. Doesn't mean that they are not there. Um, there have also been reports of, of peccary in Tobago. So it'd be really interesting to redeploy the cameras over time and see whether or not so that is in fact the case. There have been anecdotal reports of, of hunters seeing peccary in, in Tobago um, from time to time. One of the other sub-objectives was to actually look and see whether or not the transect survey data that we were collecting was comparable to what we might be collecting on, on a more uh, contemporary methodology using the cameras. And you can, we, we can do this using a simple metric by comparing the occupancy. So remember when I talked about occupancy of a given species with the cameras, you can of course also do occupancy in terms of not only the animals that are spotted on a given transect, but the community groups and the hunters would also tell us whether or not a species was uh, had apparent signs of being present in the area, but it just wasn't seen um, by the by the community groups when they were walking the transect. It's really interesting to note when we do this comparison, um, the values are quite comparable for those species that were actually detected. Um, peccary, of course, was not, not detected in the river, okay? Uh, but when you compare and contrast the other four species and you look at the rankings of these values, they are, in fact, very comparable. So that was very interesting for us to find. It would be, it'd be really interesting if we could, in fact, uh, model the data that was being collected in the transects, what is being found in the camera. So very quickly, I'll go through some of the conclusions of our research uh, thus, uh, thus far. Um, the transect surveys, while not comprehensive, um, they were still very useful. Uh, the camera trapping was somewhat comprehensive, but again, these are, these are cameras that are on the ground. There have been some studies that have put cameras up in trees for 
primates and so on, um, I would recommend, um, these will, I'm probably getting a little bit ahead of myself, but I would do, I would recommend transect surveys for things like primates in the future. Um, the moratorium does appear to have worked. We did see increases in deer, for example. We did see moderate increases in agouti. Um, however, uh, what was revealed is that certain species do appear to be somewhat in danger. I'm, I'm talking about those game species. Um, and that one in particular that, that might have us a bit concerned is the collared peccary. Okay? Um, there was need for long-term monitoring to further assess populations of mammals in Trinidad and Tobago. Um, we think that this, this has been uh, quite a successful survey to date, but it's just a snapshot. Uh, if we really want to be serious about monitoring, we need to be doing this regularly long term. Okay. We also got feedback from several stakeholders. We trained members of CBOs and NGOs. They would like to, this, this type of activity to continue for at least another 10 years. We would like for more game wardens um, to be in the area uh, conducting patrols. Um, they, of course, by and large, is a lax enforcement in terms of the laws. Uh, we need for these to be better enforced, uh, especially, of course, during the hunting season, but also outside of it. Um, and of course, all the stakeholders would like to be part of, of any roundtable discussions uh, with respect to um, developing policies moving forward. In terms of recommendations, a decision should be made with respect to hunting of peccary. We see low numbers and limited distribution. Um, as scientists, we can just present the data and the powers that be, they will make the decisions. Um, but to say that there isn't any data with which to make a decision anymore, I think is incorrect. I think we have more than enough data now. Um, a monitoring framework should be set up. We would recommend that if we can't monitor every single year, then let's at least try to do camera trapping and transect surveys every other year. Um, we would like to continue with CBOs, NGOs, conservation groups, hunting organizations. Uh, we believe they should be the ones doing the monitoring. Um, and of course, future surveys should include any designated environmentally sensitive species. More data, you know, we're, we're scientists, so we always want more data. Um, but you know, uh, in order to get a really nice baseline, um, in order to identify what trends there are, it would be good to have at least three more years of data. We note that the uh, Vision 2030 document uh, states quite clearly uh, we need to put the environment at the center of development. Um, this particular methodology, these methodologies allow us to participate in what we call green accounting, where we can, we can give account of, of what we have in our environment and present this in, uh, even when the, the Minister of Finance is, is presenting his budget, we can talk about green accounting. Um, and then uh, the EMA has been a great partner in this. They can perhaps apply for funds, and we would love to continue with them um, to generate the data that's coming out of these monitoring efforts. I want to thank, of course, uh, my fellow contributors at the UE, the EMA National Restoration Carbon Sequestration Wildlife and Livelihoods Project, money from the Green Fund that supported the project, CBO and NGO groups, hunting associations, which were key in, in helping us get this, um, get this monitoring done, family and friends, and of course, last but not least, very important animals of Trinidad and Tobago, who play a, a massive, massively important role in maintaining our environment. Um, we thank them, and thank you all for listening. Thank you very much, um, both to Professor Agard for that introduction and to Dr. Rosta for um, a very comprehensive, very detailed presentation on the results of the National Wildlife Survey. You'll now go to the chat box for the first question. And that question comes from, I'm not going to mention the name of the person who's posing the question, um, thank you for a thorough presentation. Will the maps and the data be made available for the public's use? I, I can handle that. So, yeah, so I, I believe that 
Um, I mean, this presentation is, is going to be made public. So the intention is to, to make the material public as well. Um, the exact locations of where we found animals, I, I do not think should be made public because you know we, we, we're trying to monitor these animals. Um, so we would, we would want to, to keep those details um, you know, uh, to ourselves. Thank you. Thank you, Dr. Rostam. Next question. Thanks for sharing this data. I noted line transects were conducted in Yara Blanchichez. Are there any plans to use camera traps in these areas? Can you clarify, was any data collected during the rainy season? Sorry. Uh, so the protocol that was developed using um, the camera traps called for sampling during the dry season. Um, and this, that is, of course, to be able to compare and contrast what we are finding to what might be found with other similar species in neotropical cells. Um, we do hope that sampling will be conducted in, in other areas, including Yara. Um, we would like to expand camera trapping in Central Range. We think the Victoria Miaro Forest Reserve can take more cameras. Southern Watershed, we haven't done any camera trapping as yet. So there's definite scope for more work moving forward. This is, again, the start of, of what I hope will be something of a comprehensive survey that can be conducted, if not every year, every other year in these different areas. Um, but it all depends on, on how serious we are about our wildlife and how much we actually want to um, to protect them and, and sustain these populations moving forward. Uh, in terms of doing the work during the rainy season, I would I would advocate for, for doing some of the sampling during the rainy season because we're probably missing out on a lot of the activity that, that might be important to note with regards to a lot of these species. But again, we, we also need to be careful and mindful of the logistical concerns and getting out into these very rugged areas during the rainy season. It's quite difficult. Um, and I would like to, again, applaud all of these community groups for all of their hard work uh, and their, the, the, the efforts that they put towards getting out to these remote areas to not only do cameras, but also to walk transit lines. Thank you, Dr. Oster. The next question. Dr. Oster, if you had to amend the code WA, what species would you remove from Schedule 2? the permitted hunted list and the vermin list? Um, well, I mean, I, I work a lot on, on bats as well. So um, vermin, in terms of vermin, bats, bats have been largely removed. I was happy to see that. Um, so there has been progress there. Um, probably, I would, I would probably remove Maniku as well uh, from the vermin list. In terms of, and this is me, this is my opinion. I want to make that clear. Um, in terms of species that might be removed from the hunted list, at the moment, I think we have, in my opinion, we have enough to say that, that you know, we, we want to pay attention to, to uh, peccary, but at the same time, other species are looking, are looking reasonably okay. Like I, like I mentioned in the presentation, Obuti have very high reproductive rates. They tend to recover quite quickly if we give them a chance. But it's all about monitoring. All of these species, be it on the vermin list or be it on the, on the list of species that we can hunt, we want, I, and I hope everyone agrees, we would like to continue um, dedicated monitoring so we can track and see how these different species are doing. And it may be that we have restrictions in certain areas, but they're allowed to be hunted in other areas. But this has hopefully been the start of something great where we can have more targeted approaches towards uh, sustainable hunting. Thank you, Dr. Oster. Um, do you propose to gather further data in particular on reproductive behavior? So the reproductive be behaviors is a bit more difficult to, to get to. Um, again, as you saw, there were some examples within the camera trap data where we are picking up reproductive behavior. The transect surveys might actually be, be better at picking up reproductive behavior. 
which is why I would advocate for, for there to be, them to be continued. Um, but over time, if you, if you continue to, to take pictures of these animals over time, you're going to pick up these little, what we call snapshots of behavior. You can eventually build a picture, a better picture of when these animals are being reproductively active, where they have young. And then of course, you know, we would, we would perhaps be able to make uh, a better judgment as to, as to when they should be hunted and so on. Okay, thank you. Great research and presentation. Have the results been published in a peer review journal to date? Feeling I know, I have a feeling I know who that question is from. So uh, we have uh, submitted and received comments for uh, one article to date. The, the intention is to, of course, submit a lot more. And we've responded to those comments and we are hoping for a positive response within the coming weeks. Thank you. Fantastic work. Thanks for sharing. Any plans to use some of your footage to do a short film to educate the public on our biodiversity and the importance of wildlife preservation? So uh, I'm being told uh, the, the idea would be to anybody that might be interested, you can write the EMA. And I think that this, I've always, I've always been a proponent and, and said this, this, this data belongs to the people of Trinidad and Tobago. This, these pictures are, I mean, I just gave you some of the pictures, but they really are quite incredible. And I would, I would welcome that. Um, but I've been told, write the EMA and um, they, they can probably share some of these pictures with you if you would like to, to do something like that. Thank you, Dr. Austin. Will the camera show the faces of hunters and potential poachers? That's an excellent question. So the way that the cameras have been set, uh, as you saw in the, the presentation, the, the camera is not meant to be picking up hunters' faces and so on. We point the camera down. We're not interested in, in tracking people. We're not interested in getting people's faces and then prosecuting anybody. It's a wildlife survey. That is the, the main intent. Um, that being said, I would discourage anybody from hunting outside of the hunting season. Uh, we have a hunting season for a reason. Um, we are not supposed to be out there outside in the closed season hunting. So please pay attention to the hunting regulation. But again, we are not looking for people. We are looking for animals. Thank you, Dr. Rostam, for clarifying that. Um, next question. Do you think that the collared peccary should be at the top of the list to be designated as an ESS or environmentally sensitive species? I would leave that for the powers that be. Um, I would say that as of right now, we need to pay attention to it. Uh, that's one that we want to keep a close eye on based on the data we've collected. So far. Restricted range and in the areas that we're finding them, low numbers. It's something that we, we want to focus on. Thank you. Do you think it makes sense for capybara to be on the vermin list, considering we have no structured data sets? So again, um, I, I've, I'm leaving that for the powers that be, but I would like to see um, the data that went into making a decision uh, for, for you know designating them as vermin. Um, I would also want to see research that shows that, that they are potential women. Um, maybe we could participate in, in um, future transect surveys for this particular animal. Camera traps have, have worked before. Uh, Mike Rutherford at the, U, at the UE did a really interesting bit of work uh, down at the Kearney River and found quite a few of them. So I, I would welcome uh, continued monitoring of, of that particular species. Um, I was not involved in, in, the, in the work uh, or the designation, so I, I can't really speak to it. But again, uh, it'd be really interesting to see uh, the numbers that went into the Thank you, Dr. Oster. At this point, as we had mentioned before, we will launch the poll. 
Um, it's a short poll for questions. It will be up for about three to four minutes and then it will be closed. Um, so during the this particular question, you can go ahead and um, include whatever comments or to actually fill out the poll. So are there lessons from similar territories to Trinidad and Tobago that we can learn from? I recognize that data gathering takes time and assessment can only truly follow from rich data. Are there opportunities for volunteers or apprentices to be a part of future data gathering exercises? So from, from my end, we, we at the UE, we are more involved in the design of the overall uh, program for data collection, as well as the processing of the data. The EMA has been, has been a key stakeholder in sourcing volunteers, as well as uh, groups that might be interested in participating in the surveys. So I would recommend you, you write the EMA if you're interested in participating um, and, and determining whether or not you can be involved in future, um, future surveys. Okay, thank you, Dr. Rosta. And we are just one minute short of 11. Um, and we thank you for your questions. As we had mentioned before, if there are any questions you'd like to send to the EME and you'd probably want um, more details, please send them to emawebinars at ema.co.tt. Again, emawebinars with an S at ema.co.tt. I would like to thank Professor Agard and Dr. Rostan for their very comprehensive presentations, both Dr. Rostan for what the details of the survey and for Professor Agard for really sharing with us an introduction. On behalf of the board, the management and staff of the EMA, I would like to take this opportunity to wish everyone a happy and safe Christmas. Please adhere to the COVID-19 guidelines as prescribed by the Ministry of Health as you celebrate in your groups of 10 persons or less. Thank you and have a good day.